Hello, I'm Ed Raby, otherwise known as the Rabbit Atheist, a former pastor turned atheist, now a compassionate anti-theist. Welcome to my channel. Feel free to like or dislike the video as you see fit. So feel free to hit those buttons. Feel free to comment below, and I would appreciate it if you would subscribe to the channel and hit your notification bell for more content as it is released. You're also free to share my videos as much as you like. The purpose of this channel is educational in regards to atheism and deconversion issues and Bible and theology uh, in relationship to those issues. Uh, today is Rabbit Ramblings, and it may truly be a rambling because I don't really have an overarching topic uh, to discuss, just a few small minor ones. Some of them are religious and some of them are political. Um, the big religious one, I suppose, is, and this is a little bit Johnny come lately for me because I just, I don't comment right away on when political events happen because I often find that if you wait a week or two in retrospect, you get a clearer picture. The problem with most political decisions is the media blows it up and puts a lot of smoke in front of everything, and it's really hard to see what actually happened. Sooner or later, somebody points out the context of the discussion, and then you realize, well, that's the common interpretation of this is quite wrong or in error because they haven't taken into account other factors. So when you look at some of the things that happen, uh, you have to wait a little bit. And I'm, you know, I know a lot of channels out there that get, I get they got to have the news first and all this other stuff. And I just don't do that because I've noticed that a lot of these people, when they comment so quickly, they end up looking dumb because they don't take into consideration other factors or don't wait to see if both sides respond or all sides respond to an issue before they make a comment. And there's often things that people don't consider uh, when you have to. When you consider issues, you have to sit down and listen to all the issues and you have to listen to sides and not get emotionally involved all the time. It's, it's hard to do, granted, because we all have our own bias and we all have our own things that we're fighting for. And so it's really difficult sometimes to listen uh, to the opposing side. Um, you know, I bemoan like a lot of people the fact that you can't have a decent conversation about anything anymore without people getting offended and upset. And that's, to me, don't get me wrong, I think emotions are part of the ethical equation. The problem is when you let your emotions say that, yeah, I'm right and everybody else is wrong, and you stand on that, and you die on that hill, you often end up doing something dumb or stupid. And so you have to remember, you know, if you're going to listen to things, you have to take a lot of the initial reports with a grain of salt. I remember, you know, many times that reporting has been inaccurate with the first reports. They don't know what's going on any more than anybody else, and they're trying to find out. So they report what they know. Well, some of what they know is just rumors. And until you get past all the bullshit, and get to the core of what happened. And then finally, later on, weeks later, you know exactly what happened, and it has nothing to do with the initial report. So that's why I don't comment right away on a lot of issues, because I want to hear some of the other things. Now, the big religious issue in the United States recently, I think it was a week or two ago, was that the Supreme Court ruled that Governor Cuomo's ban on religious services was unconstitutional. Now, the hue and cry on the atheist side of the ball uh, drove me nuts because these are the same atheists that will look at the First Amendment and say that first clause, that separation of church and state clause, that anti-establishment clause is an absolute. There should be no establishment of religion inside the state. Now, the problem is most atheists, with a few notable exceptions, myself included, I would say, choke on the second part. They don't want to give uh, the right to religious practice the same absolute standard. Oh, no, you, you, can't, you can't assemble and meet and do your worship service and practice your religion if there's a pandemic. Well, the counter argument to that would be, well, then you don't get your separation of church and state. We, you know, sorry, we can call a national day of prayer. We can call, you know, people to prayer in front of Congress, you know. It's a pandemic. We can use all the help we can get. See, the moment you start playing this part of the First Amendment 
is absolute and then the rest of it is relative to the situation you open that up for going back at your yourself and so <clears throat> i actually opposed ffrf's attack on these people saying they're stupid dumb you know it, it's like guys um like it or not the bill of rights and all the amendments that follow in the constitution the constitution itself does not have an ex very many exception clauses in the name of crisis you're not allowed to suspend people's rights simply because there's a pandemic or a war or some other catastrophe or disaster you're not allowed to do it and this is something that people don't like because you know they want to be safe and secure and I will point out as somebody who's an atheist who realizes I'm spinning around on a blue dot going through a universe where 99.99% .99 of it, if I was instantly transported into that part of the universe, it would kill me. Okay, the fact that we are alive and spinning on this ball is, I won't call it a miracle, but, you know, we're here. It's an improbable event, but here we are. At the same time, it also makes me realize something else. We are not safe and you're never safe. Safety is a myth. I really don't think safety is merely relative. You get as much security as you put effort into. And if you're trusting to other entities to keep you safe, I think you're being very foolish. Um, that's why I very much focus on self-reliance and independence because it is the best survival thing for the individual is to be able to you know, look at their own situation and say, this is what I need to do to survive or thrive or whatever. And that allows them the freedom to do that. So when these people are going gaga about the Supreme Court, now we shouldn't be surprised with a new addition to the Supreme Court. It's like a, it's going to be five, four, six, three decisions um, from now on in favor of the conservatives, because there's, you know, it's a six, three court for most issues. And then there are five, four for some issues, because I think the Chief Justice on occasion sides with the liberals just because it seems random at times. Um, I'm not really sure what he, he does with it other than maybe look at law precedent. So we have that decision and I'm like, no, if you're going to maintain the wall of separation of church and state, the wall has two sides, not just one. I think too many atheists make the mistake of thinking that, okay, I the only thing that matters here is to keep religion out of government. I agree, let's keep religion out of government. The problem is it also says keep government out of religion. In other words, this is why I still oppose taxation because I think it's unconstitutional, but I also have a moral problem. Taxing of churches or the taxing of any group of people and then not allowing them to speak on to where those taxes go, that's immoral to me, okay? Uh, I have a problem with taxation being theft in the first place as a libertarian, but you know, there's two inescapable things, of truths of life, death and taxes, and taxes are going to exist. And as much as I wish they didn't, we found a different way to do things. Uh, that's kind of the way it works. But if you're going to have a tax to tax a group of people and then say, oh, and by the way, because you're religious, you're not allowed to speak to what the government does to this money. To me, that's immoral. That That's a higher form of immorality to tax a group of people. So to me, you're better off keeping the state on its side of the separation of church and state and just leaving churches alone and letting people freely practice. This also goes to a human nature question, because if you start attacking religious organizations and atheists politically, then you fuel their fire. You fuel their thing of, hey, we're persecuted. I personally don't think Christians are persecuted that much in this country. They're losing some of their privileges. Like Christians for years were the ones that opened Congress with prayer. Well, then somebody pointed out there's other religions in the United States. And oh, the hue and cry uh, from the religious establishment of how we, they were being persecuted. No, you're just not allowed to have this exclusive privilege all to yourself anymore. Now, personally, I wish they got rid of the whole damn thing in the first place in front of Congress. Congress should be you know, a secular thing. If a, if a congressman is religious and wants to bow his head before a major decision, I guess that's his business. But I don't think that that should be forced on everybody else. But at the same time, I don't want to religious people to perceive me as necessarily a threat to their religiosity. I think it's foolishness to be religious. Don't get me wrong. But 
I believe if you're going to have a land of liberty, you have the right to be foolish. And so that's kind of the way it works. Now, a lot of people are going around, well, these churches meeting are threatening other people. You have to prove that in a court of law. One of the things that really bothers me about some of the analogies, I've heard the analogy, well, if you're swinging your fists around and, you know, you hit somebody, then you violated their rights. And, you know, if you have a virus like COVID-19 and you start and you have it and you go in it, you're swinging around. Well, that's not actually the perfect analogy for that. For me, it's more like you have some sort of, you know, ailment that causes you to have seizures or something like that. And you don't know when it could strike. There's a lot of ignorance that a person could claim in such a thing. Also, I've never heard of a court case where somebody was accused of assault because they another person accidentally or on or knowingly had a disease and it passed on to another person. I can't imagine how you would legally prove that or enforce it. Uh, but past legality, viruses, I think, have always been considered acts of quote unquote God or acts of nature if you're an atheist. And so it's not something you can completely control. Uh, the one thing I, I think we're all learning about coronaviruses, is there's still a lot of things we don't know about it and how it works uh, because people will take full precautions and still get it. And that there's some other way of transfer that we're not seeing. And it's it's complicated. It's far more complicated than we want to admit. So, I mean, I, I even heard that the UK and Europe are talking about their new mega super coronavirus. Somehow it keeps spreading no matter what they do. I would argue that perhaps their lockdowns are part of the problem. Um, the place where, it's, you know, uh, the WHO has warned against lockdowns now for months as a last resort. And yet the Western world seems to be oblivious to the WHO at this point, And they continue to do lockdowns as a chief means of doing the virus and which causes all kinds of other problems. I mean, I'm fairly certain, you know, that suicide rates are up. I'm fairly certain. I, I know this for a fact. If you read things, uh, drug abuse, alcoholism is up. Domestic violence is up. Uh, you're probably going to see, you know, I was joking the other day that, you know, the divorce lawyers and, and family counselors after this is over are going to have a field day. They're going to make a shit ton of money. Uh, that's kind of tongue in cheek, but I think that's going to be somewhat true. We have lost a lot of our mechanisms as a society to release pressure. And when that happened, I, I wasn't surprised this summer when we had a lot of anger and you know violence and all that stuff because the pressure cooker just doesn't have the safety valves. You know, we have our interests. You know, going to concerts, going to sporting events. You know, we have these things that are used to blow off steam. When you study social psychology, when you realize you take away some of those people's pressure things, they have to look for alternatives. And not everybody can sit in front of a television for hours on end being entertained and, quote, unquote, staying in their safe space. So not everybody works that way. Extroverts have a hard, 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 hard time with this. And I think that's that's the real issue uh, for them. You know, my life hasn't changed that much other than, you know, for a while there, I couldn't go to the gym, uh, which has had a detrimental effect probably on my health that I'm going to have to overcome here in a little bit. But in any case, what I'm saying is that most issues are more complicated. And as an atheist, I don't necessarily just jump on the bandwagon when somebody says, oh, this religious group is doing this and they shouldn't be allowed to do it. Uh, sorry, you know, as much as I don't want religion in the state, I don't think the state should be in religion either because it just invites antagonism. It also <clears throat> is not really a respecter of the separation of wall between church and state, which is the state needs to stay out of the church's business as much as possible, too. I don't think they should be involved unless a religious practice violates the rights of an individual. Um, so I leave them alone. I'm an anti-theist. But I don't wage that war through politics. I wage that war through doing what I do, which is pointing out the bullshit, education, doing the things that I can do without violating the free rights of other people. I may not think it's a smart idea for churches to meet, but I don't see any problem with a church meeting 
most church buildings are very large open areas. You can easily social distance in most of them because the vast majority of churches don't even come close to filling up their buildings. Uh, they can wear masks. They can do all the things that any other business uh, from Walmart on down to the smallest business can do. So I fail to see why they can't do that and like any other business does. But somehow these people have got to go after, you know, these religious establishments because, you know, whatever. And the Supreme Court simply pointed out the obvious. The government simply doesn't have the power to restrict religious practice or assembly or free speech or any of that stuff. The government is simply not granted that power in the United States. And this is something that causes a lot of people to be alarmed, but it's like, Welcome to an open society. It has its downfalls, but the benefits of an open society are felt every day. Uh, free interchange of ideas, uh, business, prosperity. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, closed societies have a hard time with all those things. They have a hard time advancing their science. They have a hard time advancing ideas. Uh, yeah, sure, the internet allows us to do a lot of that, but it doesn't change the fact that we have some other things involved with that. Um, well, I still have some time. I don't want like to go over 20 minutes, mostly on a rabbit rambling, unless it's necessary. But while I have, still have some time, somebody asked me to comment on what I think about the, the recent presidential election. Um, what do I think happened? Why did Trump lose? Yes, I do believe Trump lost. Uh, I, Sorry, Trumpites. I've tried to look at all the cases of fraud as much as possible and ask myself a question, even if Trump wins all these lawsuits, if he were to win all these lawsuits, is there enough votes here? The answer to that question is no, there isn't enough votes and there isn't enough votes in the right place. I think most Trump supporters forget that Trump squeaked out a victory last time. Um, he got the right states and the right electoral college votes to do it. And some of the states that he won, he won by very narrow margins. My own home state of Michigan, I think he only won by 15,000 votes, which is a very narrow margin in a, in a state of 10 million people. So it's, I'm not trying to, to diminish anything. You know, I'm not trying, I'm trying to be as objective here as possible, I guess is the best way to put it. But Trump lost the election, I think, by the numbers, even if the fraud cases were proven. But more than that, I, I think um, people have asked me my theories. Well, was it the fraud that caused him? No, because I don't think the fraud caused him to lose. Um, my own personal theory, and this is just a theory, you can take it for what it's worth, maybe comment on it if you're interested in this sort of thing. But my own personal theory is I think a lot of Republicans went to the polling booth and voted straight ticket Republican, which explains why the Republicans still won a lot of places. Um, the election in Georgia still has to take place, but they already have 50 senators. They only need one win out of two. Georgia hasn't elected a Democratic senator since 1996. So I'm interested to see, you know, if they pull off one Democratic senator, it's going to be because they work their asses off in Georgia. But I don't think they're going to pull off both. So the Senate's going to remain pretty much in Republican hands. They picked up seats in the House. All these legislatures that were supposed to be flipped to Democrat did not get flipped. Um, a lot of local races didn't change anything. The only major loss the Republicans had was Donald Trump losing the White House. And that kind of says something, doesn't it? So how does that happen? If I eliminate even the fraud, how does that happen? A lot of Republicans went to the polling booth and when they got to the presidential part of the election, they voted straight ticket Republican because that's what they do. But when they got to the presidential election, they did one of two things, I think. They either held their nose and voted for Biden or voted for George Jorgensen or some other third party candidate, did not holding their nose because they, they felt that that person best represented them or they left it blank. Uh, that's a reasonable possibility. And what happens then is Biden, of course, uh, the Democrats definitely had a major push. They wanted the, the Democrat mistake in this last election is they focused so much on one simple expression, get rid of orange man, get rid of Trump. Um, and I think that's why that's what they succeeded at. 
uh, everything else, they forgot that there's like a gazillion elections that ref reflect all areas of government. This is one of the real problems in American politics. Everybody focuses on the presidency. And that tells me one, two things. One, the presidential powers are too high. Uh, there's supposed to be more given to Congress. Congress has voted away a lot of its powers to the president over the years, and they need to get them back. But also, um, I think the media focuses way too much on the presidency. They don't focus on the other branches of government as much until you know Congress is making a major vote or the Supreme Court is making a major decision. So we'll see what happens. But I really think that Trump lost because some Republicans are just sick of his shit. They're sick of trying to defend a guy that has antics that require constant defense. Uh, I, I've lost track of the number of Republicans told me, I wish the son of a bitch would just stay off Twitter. OK, and I think that's the problem. Uh, people ask me what I think about Trump. OK, I'm going to give you my unadulterated opinion. Don't crucify me. But Trump has never been told no most of his life. Maybe as a child he was. But once he became an adult and started doing business, he's always been the boss. He's never been a subordinate to anybody. <clears throat> and so when somebody tells him, no, he can't do that, he gets pissed off. Uh, he throws a mini temper tantrum. And that's been Trump's problem through his whole presidency. He doesn't know how to collaborate. He'll talk about the art of making the deal, but dude, I don't see you practice it while you were president. There was no deals made. There was no reaching across the aisle to the Democrats legitimately. And a, a lot just didn't freaking happen. Um, Trump never won the popular vote. I always, I love the Republican. Oh, but he's, you know, the people of America love him. Well, apparently the majority of Americans who voted don't. Okay. And they haven't twice. Um, I really think Republicans should convince Trump somehow to just drop all the lawsuits and bullshit that he's trying to go to the Supreme Court again about Pennsylvania right now. And it's like, dude, you know, you can't, I don't, I think it sets a dangerous precedent, Republicans. Do you really want the Democrats to be able to just go to the Supreme Court and overturn the election if they don't like the results? Do you really want any state of the union? I was happy that the Supreme Court struck down the Texas case because the Texans were just say, we don't like the results of the election, so we're going to sue. And it's like, uh, I'm sorry, just because you don't like the results of the election doesn't give you the right to sue and overturn it. You know, <laughs> it doesn't happen that way. It doesn't work that way. And so I was glad that one got struck down. And, you know, somebody commented that was the end of the drama. I said, this is Trump. There's never going to be an end of the drama as long as he's alive. Um, <clears throat> he's going to be dramatic. Uh, but I personally think the Republicans should take the fact that they should actually look at what happened as a victory, because despite Trump's loss, they held the line or gained ground in a lot of significant ways. And I think the most significant thing of Trump's presidency is his Supreme Court nominations. He got to do, what, four of the damn things? And he, re you know, he not only held the line conservatively, but he got to replace Ruth Bader Ginsburg with somebody who is her direct polar opposite in many ways. So if you look at it fairly from a political point of view, not uh, I'm not talking right or wrong, the conservatives have gained a lot of ground under Trump. At the same time, Trump is kind of a pain in the ass to defend all the time. And the Republicans really need a candidate that can unite America a little bit more than Trump does. Trump is a very good, is divisive and a relentless self promoter what I think he really needs to do, what the Republicans really need to do is find somebody that can actually win the American people's majority vote and win the Electoral College. That's going to be a challenge because I think the Republicans need to face the music that they are overly religious and they lean too far to the religious right. I think that's particularly true if, if the Republicans suddenly went neutral on LGBTQ rights and religious rights. And they say, yeah, we're going to defend religious people's rights, but we're not going to fight for their privileges anymore. And you know what? If gay people and lesbians and all the rest of them want to get married, that's not our business. Now, as a libertarian, I don't even know why the state's involved in marriage in the first place. I don't see the purpose of it. Uh, what, what's the safety issue? You know, we don't want the right. It basically comes down to a control mechanism of deciding parts of society of who gets married to who. And I don't really think the government should be involved in that in the first place. So <clears throat> I just don't get it. Um, so there you have that. 
Uh, that's kind of my opinion, and, it, and that's an educated opinion. I've been reading about this, and I'm like, mm, I just don't see it. Uh, as an atheist, I'm not going to sit there and dance. Uh, I don't think Biden and Harris are an improvement, by the way. Um, I've told people that were cheering about that. I said, you do realize that you couldn't have elected a couple of people that absolutely during their careers have given the middle finger to what BLM was protesting all summer. Um, Camilla Harris is a cop. <laughs> okay, she's a cop. You know, she's blue. Okay, in more ways than one. And Biden, yeah, Biden's a neocon. Okay, he's, I don't know if he's a true progressive. Um, I don't know. My prediction for his presidency is going to go something like this. I think, like so many people, I don't know if he has the backbone to do major decisions when they need to be done. I really sense in him another Jimmy Carter, a very informed, maybe even a very compassionate president. Not sure. But at the same time, I, I don't see the kind of decisiveness that a president needs. So that's kind of where I'm standing with that. Um, I think that's all I'm going to ramble about today. You're probably free to comment and disagree with me all you want. Uh, keep, uh, as I remind people, you know, the discussions on this channel are to be kept civil. Um, you know, just I'm just spotting my opinion. If you can change my mind, more than welcome to try to change my mind. Uh, in the meantime, I want to thank you all for coming by, and hopefully someday I can convince you to be a rabid atheist like myself. In the meantime, this is Ed Raby, also known as the Rabid Atheist, signing off and wishing you a blessed Yuletide.